morning, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to our event today, Open Learning and Education Seminar, which um, has come about because, unsurprisingly, because of COVID. And our Pro Vice Chancellor for Research at the Open University um, gave us all some money to have a look at what's going on and to do some research around this very, very important um, happening. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to review and have a look at some of the work we've been doing during um, this time on the COVID research front. As there are a lot of projects and a lot of people um, who've contributed, we decided to have a firehouse event. And of course, when there's a fire, you've got to be quick and you've got to put the water to get the fire out. So um, our speakers are going to um, speak just for two minutes and there'll be time for one question. And then we're gonna move going to have a short break and we're going to move into a panel event. We've got some very good speakers with us today to discuss what's going on in HE and their international speakers. So I hope you will enjoy that. You know, please, you know, put your questions into the chat. We want to know what you're thinking and the issues that we want to raise. And um, I know it's not quite the same as being together. But I'm going to hand over um, to um, Thea, who's going to run uh, this part of the event. I see we've got our first speaker who's really quick off the mark here. So over to you, chaps. Looking forward to it. Speak to you all soon. Thank you, Denise. Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, just to read briefly that this is a firehouse session, which means that our presenters have only five minutes to talk about their work. Two minutes uh, they present their work and then three minutes they get one or two questions from you, from the audience. Uh, I would like to ask you to keep your microphones and cameras off unless uh, you are presenting. Uh, should you have any questions, please, so you're encouraged to use the chat functionality. Over to our first presenter. Simon. Uh, effective teacher professional development, or TPD for short, is considered essential for the improvement of teaching quality in low and medium income countries. So our project has promoted TPD in Assam, India, by the development and delivery of three digital badges to secondary school teachers. These badges help build teacher understanding of and practice in using technology for learning. It's a collaboration between three academics from IET in Wells and the Tata Institute of Social Sciences based in Mumbai. The project has three main aims. First, to utilise and scale the affordances of open digital badges and the teaching and assessment tools behind them. Each badge comprises two to four weeks of study and a task putting this learning into practice. The latter is important and was intended to help address an often frequent shortcoming of TPD delivery. Course materials were offered in English and SMEs to ensure access for all, and each featured peer assessment. Significant supports were also provided, such as orientation events, a telegram group, forums, and volunteer tutor trainers. Teachers from over 200 schools in Assam have completed and earned at least one digital badge so far. The second aim has been to continue our ongoing work promoting a conversation about digital badges at the policy and strategic level, in particular with a view to rethink and innovate how TPD is supported and recognised. Indian government policy recently set minimum expectations for TPD for every teacher, so how is this to be achieved? Last November, as part of a previous project, we held an event for highly placed government officials. In this project, we have enjoyed state support and in April, Assam's Principal Secretary of Education himself hosted and issued our, and indeed the state's first ever TPD badge. Our final aim has been to undertake research into how new modes and processes of digital assessment at scale, such as digital badges, have implemented, perceived and been used. Early research data indicates strong support amongst teachers, so going forward there will be potential to further scale implementation, to share knowledge and to develop new research opportunities. Thank you, Simon. Over to James for some questions. Excellent, Simon. 
firstly, can I ask a context specific question? Have you seen any differences as to how the use of digital badges is perceived by students in different contexts, perhaps comparing India to the UK? Uh, yes, um, I think uh, very much in respect to the the uh, the reception that it gets from teachers, it is clearly informed by um, local uh, um, existing um, uh, cultures um, and uh, use of um, things such as um, uh, certificate certification in, in teacher professional development. Um, one of the things that I think is 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 really important to understand is the fact that. Um, there are many there are opportunities in in, in, in in places such as India to really build and to develop the concept of digital badges into something which is useful for teachers themselves. Um, so I think where while we may have a particular formulation of that, it is still very much in its um, its um, its embryonic stage over there. So we are at a moment in time where we we really have a potential to help shape that conversation, as I said in my presentation, um, and to to build on those uh, the sort of the, the, the previous um, understandings of how one recognises uh, professional development and also to form new conceptions of that. That's great. Thank you very much, Simon. We really appreciate that. Um, we'd be happy to move on to the next presenter. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Joe Hanley. I'm a lecturer in social work. So this research is about piloting free um, CPD, so continuous professional development resources to support social workers involved in disasters, including pandemics. So social workers have been essential uh, key workers throughout the COVID-19 uh, pandemic response. However, uh, as in previous disasters, social workers have experienced numerous challenges in responding to the pandemic, including a lack of contingency planning and training, uh, difficulty being flexible within strict statutory contexts, and uh, disproportionate impact on vulnerable people that they support. So prior to 2020, the start of the pandemic, I've been working alongside the British Association of Social Workers, uh, some experts, government partners, uh, social workers and people with lived experiences of disasters to develop the uh, support and knowledge around the role of social work during disasters. Uh, the expertise of this group was actually drawn on quite a bit during the pandemic and I supported in developing a number of guides and supporting documents for social workers working during the pandemic, including in relation to ethics, self-care, uh, the role of social workers within multidisciplinary teams. The, the project that I'm undertaking uh, as part of this uh, looks at piloting the use of free online continuous professional development resources to rapidly upskill social workers during uh, disasters or, or working in disaster response, including during future disasters or pandemics. The online resources have been largely completed uh, with the support of colleagues uh, in the Institute for Educational Technology at the OU. And uh, an initial, it, I should say that they were also based on an initial system, systematic literature review uh, carried out by colleagues in the University of Stirling, who have been great partners as well, who identified key themes and research uh, building on the work of the working group. So we're just about ready to start the pilot Thank now. Uh, Thanks, Joe. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I couldn't see you during that. That's okay. Table. James, over to you. Thank you, Joe. Really interesting. Can I ask, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed or influenced the specific need for these materials to be available? Uh, I, I guess we were previously always working with social workers who had a small group of social workers who had experience in disasters because unlike a lot of places in the world uh, the UK has been relatively lucky in the fact that we don't deal with regular uh, environment uh, we don't deal with regular uh, you know hurricanes or tsunamis or earthquakes and things like that whereas a lot of the a lot of social workers in other parts of the world have a lot of development around this so we were working with a lot of social workers who had been involved in say Grenfell Tower and the response and supporting people after that or the Manchester Arena bombings uh, and then you know historical things like the Hillsborough disaster as well but the pandemic has really given almost all social workers if not all social workers in the country the experience of working during a disaster so suddenly we've gone from having a relatively small amount of social workers who had experience working disasters to arguably every social worker in the country having an experience of working in a disaster situation so I think that this has driven the point home about the need. 
it's kind of specific training because social work you know, to a large degree has become more narrow in its focus and quite focused in statutory specific tasks, meaning that social workers can be a bit uncomfortable stepping outside that context. And we really hope that these resources provide, uh, you know, give social workers the skills and also just the confidence to be able to step outside those specific statutory tasks and to more effectively respond to disasters and or pandemics in the future. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. And if you could give a rapid 20 second response, how will these materials and the pilot be evaluated? Uh, yeah, 20 seconds. Well, uh, well I'm, I'm going to be focusing on uh, democratic evaluation. So the idea of thinking about these uh, these materials and the pilot within the wider public valuing. So not necessarily specifically just focusing on what people thought about these resources, the specific impact they have on one social worker or one team, but thinking about their wider, broader impact and, and potentially even things around uh, developing more awareness about this topic. Excellent, Joe. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Thanks. We'll be happy to hand over to our next speaker, Professor Teresa Kremen. Thank you, Joe. Sarah is going to start us off. Hello, good morning, everybody. This work addresses increasing concerns about the well-being of primary age children in the UK, and in particular, those most vulnerable and disadvantaged, given that research has predicted that the impact of COVID-19 on the most vulnerable of children is likely to be profound. The aims of the project are to provide rich texts and conversational resources for teachers and parents as they seek to support children's well-being at this time through reading together. That's teacher to pupil or parent to child. Reading together supports young children's well-being by providing a relaxed space to explore issues in sensitive, subtle and respectful ways. From a list of over 150 picture fiction, the OU team selected 30 books that, that focus on social and emotional challenges such as bereavement or anxiety and reflect children's diverse lives and realities, including disability, culture, sexuality. Diversity, of course, is significantly underrepresented in children's literature. Those books that are available are not well known in classrooms or in the home. We analysed the books multimodally and we've developed a framework to assist parents and teachers to select, discuss and share picture fiction. We're developing CPD and home resources to mediate that framework so that parents and teachers can deepen their engagement with picture books. And these will guide open ended book talk in which and foster conversations in which children's voices, concerns and issues lead the way. This will encourage understanding of others' worlds, as well as the capacity to cope with uncertainty together. In this way, our research and the accompanying resources will support children's social and emotional well-being. We'll be sharing the work through the OU Reading for Pleasure network. That's over 100 teacher reading groups across the UK, 34 initial teacher education institutions, and our work with over 60 schools. And of course, our research-informed website. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Sarah. You, that was, that was great. Can I firstly ask, as well as well-being support, is your work going to support teachers as they seek to achieve academic catch-up? Yes, thanks, James. I'll pick up that. Uh, certainly it is the case, there's international uh, research evidence that shows that when parents or, or uh, teachers have conversations with uh, children around books, conversations count, conversations matter. The quality of that conversation is partly based on the talk itself, but partly based on the quality of the text. We've identified very high quality texts. And so the, that conversation will feed in to a young child's comprehension, widening vocabulary subtly and unconsciously, but over time. But more importantly, perhaps, it will feed into the child's motivation to read, their desire to read for pleasure. And we have much stronger evidence that shows the will to read influences the skill. The OECD data unequivocally shows us a clear trajectory between the two. They feed each other in a kind of bi-directional relationship. So if these young children are reading these fabulous books, talking about these fabulous books, they're going to be feeding into their wider comprehension and vocabulary. But more importantly, perhaps, they're going to be feeding into their desire to read. And when they become readers, habitual readers in childhood, that will stand them in good stead for the rest of that journey because if we if young people read for pleasure they fly faster and further through the curriculum and into their future careers than those who don't thank you teresa and 
could I also ask, how will you ensure that parents as well as teachers hear about this work in order to support reading together at home? Thanks, good point. Well, we, we do have a very strong professional network of teachers, but in recent years, we've been working harder uh, to develop uh, connections with parents, not only through uh, teachers, but also directly through parents. On one of our advisory board is the CEO of Parent Kind, which is the umbrella organisation for all uh, parent teacher associations in the country. And so we're working with them on blogging, potentially a webinar, we haven't fully explored ways to do that yet, but we will be. And we'll be linking this in to the OU's book NIC, which is part of this De Department for Education's summer of reading uh, this summer to try and reach out to parents to have family um, reading picnics, as it were, uh, and to begin to share it there too. Great, thank you very much for that. We'll be happy to move over to our next project presenter, Hilary Collins. Hi, thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, our project is actually about the uh, impact of COVID-19 on continuing professional development requirements uh, for organisational development in the UK. Uh, what we actually did was um, realise about October 2020 that people were being um, devastated, certain industries were devastated by COVID-19, as we all know. We reflected on industry reports from McKenzie and Deloitte, which were highlighting sk certain skills laps. And from that, we developed a proposal to uh, do some in-depth creative workshops with different organisations across organisational sectors and industries in four nations um, to try and establish what the job requirements were that were required. Um, we did this using a design thinking technique looking at a collaborative approach, a creative approach, working with people to define their needs and we used uh, the design thinking approach, which looks at empathy first, understanding what the user requirements are. And you can see here a couple of illustrations of personas. Um, in order to kick this off, we did a wide range of audio surveys with people who've been impacted by COVID, asking them what they thought their work skill requirements were. And we developed um, these six personas, which we took out to industry and to other universities as a starting point for our discussions on requirements. We found to, we find out actually that um, the, the, the job skills that were required, certainly things like emotional intelligence and creativity, were really very much in line with the future of work field, what they had denoted. What, what we also I'm found... Sorry. sorry, I have to stop you. Time's up. Thanks for your Thank presentation. You. Over to James for some questions. Thank you, Hilary. Can I first ask, what was the most surprising data or aspect of the data that you collected in the project? Um, I think the most surprising aspect of the data was that industry at that particular point didn't have much of an inkling of their job skills requirements. And during the workshops, we had to go back uh, and actually work with them on what their business model was likely to be first. And from there, move forward to the job skills requirements that would come from that shift in the business model. As we all know, you know industries like creative industries and hospitality um, are really looking at how they can operate in different ways now. Great, thank you. Um, then can I can I ask something slightly different? Have you got any early insights as to what they consider to be key skills needed for upskilling or reskilling that would help people secure a job? Um, I, I definitely think um, creative skills and emotional intelligence are the key skills. And we've reflected that in the development of our new micro-credential, which is being launched in June, so that pe and people who have been affected or furloughed or lost jobs during COVID can actually have free places on that micro-credential. Great, thank you very much, Lynette. Um, we'll be happy to pass over to our next project presenter, Lynette Thomas at the OU in Wales. 
Hi there, um, good morning, Bordadar. In 2019, I began conversations with Cardiff Council around the potential for professional training for teachers. Originally, this was to look at increasing teachers' digital competencies for the new curriculum for Wales, which is being introduced in September 22. This was usurped by the more pressing need to support teachers to pivot online as a result of the pandemic. Funded by HEFCU, the Cardiff Commitment CPD pilot project was co-designed to support the professional development needs of teaching staff in their approach to blended teaching and learning pedagogy. Over a period of six months, we delivered six workshops and six webinars to a range of teachers from 21 institutions across Cardiff, from primary, secondary, FE, the music service and the regional consortium. Working with the OU's Learner and Discovery Services, the Institute of Educational Technology and the School of Education. Webinars were recorded and made available by the Welsh Government Education Platform Hub to teachers across Wales. And we also translated Taking Your Teaching Online, an open learn 24 hour course for our Welsh language teachers. The project was also an opportunity to raise the profile of the OU and the benefits of quality online distance learning in the education sector, an area where we want to grow our activity in Wales. IET evaluated the project and we've been able to share this learning with our partners. Engagement levels did decrease for many participants due to the challenges faced by schools during the winter lockdown, but those who were able to remain engaged felt the intended benefits. The findings have stimulated ongoing discussion with, within the steering group partners and we are currently in discussion with Welsh Government about future funded rollout across Wales and how we use the OU's curriculum and expertise for delivering blended learning for upskilling teachers to deliver the new curriculum for Wales. This project is a great example of OU collaboration with local partners and in Wales we call this our civic mission. Thank you. Diolch. Thank you, that's great. Right on time. Over to James. Thank you, Lynette. And nice to hear that kind of sense of localisation. Um, can I first ask, how has the project helped the confidence of teachers in their delivery of a blended pedagogy? I think the fact that we had mixed learning groups was really important. So fellow teachers were able to engage with each other across all levels in primary, secondary, FE and of course in the music service. And they were absolutely essential to the co-design um, ethos of this project. And, and for example, one of the first workshops delivered by OU um, experts was around online classroom management and um, came from the participants themselves. So I think um, the fact that we were able to make them available afterwards also helped um, helped grow their confidence. Great. Um, and could I secondly ask, where do you envisage or hope this pilot project will lead to um, in the future? So um, we have started discussions with Welsh Government about how we can really roll this out across Wales. So this was in a specific local authority area. And actually what we'd like to do is to roll it out across different education consortia across Wales. Um, so it's something available for all teachers in Wales with the um, added impetus, of course, of the Welsh language um, that we need to do everything bilingually in Wales for all of our um, public facing work. So I think, um, working on sort of that confidence of teachers and educators being able to deliver online um, through the OU's expertise, but also for COVID, um, but also for the new curriculum for Wales, which is a really, really exciting um, period of change for our teachers. And so how to get um, access to training across the board, across Wales, will be really essential. So, um, yeah, great partnership opportunities with Welsh Government and our educators across Wales. Excellent. Um, and I think we have time for just another quick, rapid response to the question from Mary Jacob in the chat, which is what lessons from your project might also be useful for HE lecturers? Ooh, um, well, actually, we, we're, we're also working with Cardiff University at the moment um, around um, one of our micro credentials um, for adult um, adult learners. So I think it's a very different approach in many ways for working with with adults and working with with young people. So um, I'm more than happy to share our findings um, for you um, and send you send you the report, uh, the, the, the evaluation with our recommendations, should you wish. Great. Thank you, Lynette. Really Thank excellent. Thank you very day. much. Um,
I'll be happy to pass over to our next presenter, Nashua Ishmael. Uh, good morning, all. Um, yeah, I'm waiting for my slide. Okay. Um, thank you. Good morning, all again. Uh, during June to August 2020, over 500 teachers and educators from Africa took part in the Pathways for Learning pro uh, project through Open Learn courses to support this shift to remote teaching in response to the pandemic. Survey data in this project suggested that e-assessment is a, a challenging area for our colleagues in Africa and more understanding about this topic is needed. This current new project is a follow-up from the previous summer project and it is a collaborative approach between the OU and colleagues in Africa. This project goes through four steps. Step one, which is ready done, identifying the needs by a poll that has been released with a participant from Pathways projects to end up with three to four key issues and uh, in the, uh, as a response to their needs to give them priority in the research. Step two, developing resources to respond to the needs in step one by experts from the OU. Step three is the dissemination of these resources to facilitate experiencing these resources by their beneficiaries in Africa with the help of the ACDE, African Council of Distance Education in Africa. Step four, co-evaluation of these resources in real-time interactive webinar attended by e-assessment experts from the OU and from our colleagues in Africa and colleagues who have already experienced these resources. We aim by the end of this project to help colleagues in Africa to customize and tailor their, these resources to respond to their local and contextual needs, and that will inform higher education in Africa to respond to the remote uh, to the shift to remote teaching in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Najwa. You finished before the time ends. I'm James? not trying to make it. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. James. Very prompt, Nashua. Excellent. Can I first ask, what are the most challenging topics in e-assessment for HE or higher education academics in Africa? Uh, the first top hot topic uh, with our colleagues is integrity, malpractice and cheating in, 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 uh, for assessment. That is one of the hot topics. Uh, the, the second one is e-assessment for large class number. And we ask about this, it's like over 200 students in the class, how to assist these students. The third topic, it's about e-assessment for hands-on experienced subjects like nursing, physical education. So uh, educators asking, how can I assess uh, the student who has who needs to uh, to uh, for example take the blood pressure for a student and the fourth one which actually we found it uh, with a team that cross-referenced the other three which is innovation innovation of technology uh, in e-assessment and of course we consider this the limited broadband affordance and the limited uh, uh, technology ac accessibility in some areas these are the four topics that uh, are the result of the surveys Thanks, Nashua. Um, we have a, a comment from David in the chat who thanks you for highlighting these challenges that have been experienced um, across HE in Africa. Um, can I ask, secondly, um, how do you see this project informing research as well as scholarship in the OU? Well, we found, I think it's a win-win agreement for the OU side where I think that can uh, develop, uh, we can develop learning resources that for uh, uh, our colleagues and maybe other similar contexts with the same approach because as a feedback from this project and also from the previous project, uh, we found that there are other similar areas that may be, uh, with, they need resources to be developed, like real-time teaching, non-real-time teaching, uh, uh, technology, uh, developing technology which uh, with limited affordance. So similar uh, resources can be developed uh, the same way. Also, knowledge exchange events. I think that can open pipelines for different, different initiatives with knowledge ex exchange between ourselves, uh, the OU, and other other African countries and other countries who have similar uh, contexts. And I think that also may open uh, other uh, uh, opportunities for bidding uh, in the same area. Excellent. Thank you, Nashua. Um, we really appreciate those responses and we're happy to pass over to our next 
project presenter. Um, we will have Sylvia Warnock and Miriam Hawke. Hello, thank you very much for having us. The OU's Open Centre for Languages and Cultures, launched in 2020, carries significant political relevance. Within the context of a declining languages sector in UK higher education, this important investment recognises that languages are strategically vital for recovery and the future of the UK. Therefore, this development is designed as a testbed for alternative learning products alongside traditional accredited modules, with, for example, new delivery models, assessment approaches like professional body endorsement and types of curricula. Our objectives are equipping learners with highly relevant communication skills, also in times of crisis, addressing uh, disparities in access to languages provision and to fulfill the OU social justice mission this week. Our principles of working in the centre are co-creation with partners like charities and research informed provision. Here are some examples of our COVID related or resulting in COVID uh, short courses. One is the Languages of Disaster course, exploring ways in which COVID-19 has been narrated across the world in 11 languages, equipping learners with a toolkit for critically evaluating global crises. Another one is spoken English for health and social care workers, which is applied learning and use of English when environmental and non-verbal cues are missing due to face masks and PPE. We also do a lot of work in indigenous and community languages. For example, our development of British Sign Language and English for Deaf People curriculum together with a charity. And this is informed by collaborative research with the deaf community to remove their barriers to participation in society. It features a novel Thank pedagogy you. and means for digital time, communication. Time up, uh, sorry, I cut you. Uh, over and you uh, just see it, it's fully online. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I firstly ask, now that Britain has left the EU, is there really a need for more and new language courses? Thanks for the question. Well, there is a report from August 2020, almost hot off the press by the British Academy, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the Association of School and College Leaders, the British Council and Universities UK. It states very clearly what Sylvia has already mentioned, that languages are strategically vital for the future of the UK post-Brexit and post-pandemic. And last week, there was a meeting of the old party parliamentary group on modern languages. And there was a report presented that illustrated that language capabilities are a key driver for the success of small and medium enterprises in the UK. For the first time, that report provided statistic proof that language capabilities add 30% in value to exporting success. And this is really good news for modern language teaching. And our short courses in the Open Centre for Languages and Cultures are ideal for the employees of these enterprises. Cool. Thank you very much for that, uh, and rightly so. Um, can I secondly ask, what are the challenges that come with teaching British Sign Language in an online medium, and, and particularly um, uh, perhaps at a more advanced level, what are you going to do to overcome these challenges? That's a very good question. Thank you. So British Sign Language is obviously a spoken language. That is why online delivery needs to allow us to capture all subtleties of signing and related body language so that we can recreate the immersive experience of face-to-face -face communication with sign language through the online medium. And to achieve this, we are working with the development team of our conferencing software provider create a solution that is accessible for deaf and speaking learners and that, for example, incorporates features like mirroring. And we are also undertaking research into effective multimodal transcription of recorded communication using the same tool, same conferencing tool. And we are working on the development of a dedicated teaching approach for distance learning of British Sign Language. We're going to trial a combination of synchronous and asynchronous modes 
especially at higher levels of the design language where the courses need to cover a significant amount of content in the relatively short period of time. And we are also developing students British Sign Language study skills as well as their language proficiency. Thank you very much, Mayam, and thank you both for that presentation. Um, I'd now like to kindly pass over to Maria Aristaidou. And Nashua, good morning all. Uh, so the aim of this IT study was to understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on OU students. So during November 2020, we interviewed 30 students who were studying with us during the pandemic. Um, the selection of students was made based on survey responses they gave uh, in a previous study on COVID-19. So in that way, we made sure that with our selection, we captured experiences across genders, faculties, age groups, ethnicities, but also the experiences both of those who reported high or low impact on their learning activities. Um, our study's main findings indicate that our students' learning activities and habits overall were not that much affected, and even some of them mainly older students, had more time to study during the pandemic. Uh, students also expressed their appreciation for the OU support and in particular their tutor support. However, they also highlighted some areas that need improvement. Uh, these areas were mainly related to their personal circumstances during the pandemic, like uh, employment constraints, with students expressing their need to have them heard and accommodated to a greater extent. Another important area, area was the OU communication about changes to the modules, with students suggesting improvements and the need to receive more information about the availability of tutors during these times. So our findings made us consider ways that the Open University could better support the students during the pandemic or other similar disruptions. And some suggestions involve reconsideration of the university teaching, which is mainly focusing on a computer screen, and instead using a greater range of technologies, learning activities, and interaction types. Another suggestion is the better signposting of relevant support and available resources, and even a space for sharing positive you, stories for student yeah, support. I'm um, done. Thank, thank you. James? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, could I firstly ask, what has the impact of COVID been on the study progress as well as the completion um, of students? Um, well, hello again. So actually the, the impact here, some of the students reported that it is negative, where they found that's really they are kind of cases of anxiety and feeling under pressure, or maybe some of these that then they already lost their jobs. This is a negative aspect, but it's not all of them. Other, they found it actually, it puts them because they have more time when they to, to pay to their, their, to their study, and it uh, motivated them to the study completely completion and the progress. One of the interesting themes that came across uh, the, uh, the, uh, the impact on the study completion and progress, it's the quality of the study completion. So what quality the students do really go ahead. So some of the students, they really, for, for them, they said, actually, we're very satisfied because we got X mark and this is a high mark I didn't expect. And that is a quality for them. Other students, they say, actually, we are in this course because it's our interest in the topic and we are really happy because we learned something yeah. and other they say no actually because of the pandemic i didn't learn what i'm looking for and that's actually open a pipeline for future opportunities for this project to yeah. study what are the motivations for the ou students to get enrolled the course and maybe that we can build up a standardized uh, 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 study to uh, to know the motivation at the beginning of the course and during the course and by the end of the course and that will help us to build up a better understanding about the background of our students. Thank you, Nashua. Could I secondly ask, um, how have students found the communication between themselves and their tutors during the lockdown period? 
Well, this communication is one of the, uh, I would say, emerging theme across different main topics. So it's so, sometimes it's really down to the student themselves because they are not really uh, willing to communicate. So they say, actually, it's OK. It went uh, all right because already I would like to uh, uh, to like make it a standalone study and I'm not really interested to just I'd like to do my, my work. Other, they are on the other hand that they found this one. They are dis dissatisfied because they would like the tutor all the time that to uh, to communicate with them, and they are really interested that the tutor initiate the communication. And other communication for them, it's a uh, learning behavior. So it is behavior uh, that how they manage their learning. So it's really what not one size fits all, and it's down to the students themselves. Thank you very much, Nashra, and thank you, Maria. Um, I would like to now kindly pass on to our closing project and closing presentation, but certainly not least, um, here's Sas Amoa. Marvellous, thank you very much. Um, OK, so um, just a bit of context, first of all. Um, we're going to do this project and we're going to put on the Oakland Race and Ethnicity Hub. And for those of you who don't know, the hub was um, created in the wake of Black Lives Matter movement. Um, last year, following calls for global justice. Um, so we thought it would be a great place to have these resources, have a hub that pulls all these resources through, that show historical perspectives, um, current day challenges on race and ethnicity, and somewhere that you can have articles, videos, audios, timelines and courses that explore themes of race, racism, ethnicity across the faculty or the faculties within the Open University. Um, yes, yeah, so the hub was conceived really and developed with the support of the Open University, but also the Black and Minority Ethnic Network, through which I'm one of the, the co-chairs. Um, so specifically, we realised not too long into this um, um, pandemic that the research, even though it's still happening, that the, a lot of the data seems to suggest that certain groups have been disproportionately impacted by COVID over others. And I thought it would be a really good example to actually do a short film to start looking at some of the reasons that the coronavirus has really negatively impacted um, certain groups of people, particularly people of colour, um, in the beginning. But as well, it would be really good to use the short film to just dispel a lot of the myths, the problematic myths that arise in relation to ideas of race um, and biology and genetics. Um, but we thought it would also be a really good opportunity to use it as kind of like an opening gambit for a film that starts to explore the inequalities that exist anyway, that will be, have that been brought to the public's attention recently. Um, it'd be a really good opportunity to see, see that a lot of these inequalities haven't just started during the pandemic, but exist. And we've got lots of research as well about all of that stuff in the past. And it'd be really good to use this as just the opening gambit to really explore some of these themes within a short 10, 15 minute film. Um, so yeah, our project is going to be a film really exploring the disproportionate impact of COVID on certain communities. Thanks, Sas. Uh, that's great. James? Yeah, thank you, Sas, and, and such a poignant topic. Um, can I firstly ask, how do you put together a documentary such as this? How do you script it and choose selectively uh, what you want to put in such a, a short time frame? Um, yes, yeah, so I suppose... I mean, it really helps to have something that resembles the structure. Um, so you've got some idea of the key points and themes that you really want to raise and things you think are really important to cover. Um, but you really also don't, you don't want to be too prescriptive as well, like you might do with a drama. Um, and you don't want to really um, um, second guess where the story might take you. You have to be really kind of open to the kind of um, answers you might get from the people you're interviewing and you might have to be really open to the kind of case studies that you might get, get as well. So on the one hand you, you you have a kind of a vague structure and you really want to touch upon the key themes but actually try not to be too prescriptive as well so lots of um, the, the story itself has an opportunity to surprise you and you can learn something new that you hadn't quite planned for. Thanks, Sass. Um, and secondly, can I ask, is there is there much video content on the race and ethnicity hub? Um, increasingly. So we officially, I think, launched the hub um, after Black History Month last year. But during the course of Black History Month, we managed to capture a lot of those events, which was fantastic. Not only because we got quite a bit of content, but all of the videos were quite specific to OU, the OU, the situation with the OU as well, in relation to degree awarding gap and the experience of staff. So we've got, I think, about 10 to 15 videos 
um, that exists exclusively um, based on the content that was produced on Black History Month, which is great, really fantastic to have those there and the kind of the accompanying articles as well. Um, but I think this is the first thing that we would have commissioned specifically for the hub and relates to kind of um, such a um, important issue which is so current. Um, so we've got, I think, 10 to 15 um, existing presentations, but in terms of new fresh video content, this will be one of the first things we've produced. Great, thank you, Sass. Um, Lynette has also just commented to say that there is also further work being done regionally um, in Wales. To finally ask, um, is this exclusively a project that involves open university academics? Um, no, but we are starting off with, many of you would be aware of Dr Jenny Douglas and she's a senior lecturer in Wales. She's done a huge amount of work on kind of inequalities in race in the past. So she'll be kind of leading on this work and it's fantastic to have her on board. Um, but we'd also, we've touched base with um, um, Dr Winston Morgan, who's a reader in toxicology um, and clinical biochemistry from the University of East London. He's done lots of stuff for The Guardian as well and he's very keen to be involved. So we have those two signed up and a few others we're waiting to hear back from. Great, thank you, Sass. Um, that was the last project presentation that we've had during this session. Happy to hand over to Thea to summarise. Thanks, James. Um, well, I would like first to thank all of the presenters for the very interesting presentations and the very interesting uh, question and answer session. Uh, I put together a summary of uh, the presentations we hear about today. Uh, so they covered a range of topics and audiences uh, with a special and I would, lay, I would say expected focus on teachers and professional development across different contexts. Uh, as we have seen, the research activity in response to COVID-19 was not uh, restricted to the UK, uh, but also expanded in contexts such as India and Africa. Uh, activities uh, presented uh, had two objectives. Uh, one, to capture the impact of COVID-19, uh, such as the impact of COVID on OU students, their assessment and study practices, as a means to improve the OU provision. And uh, secondly, uh, they sought to implement interventions uh, that have the potential to support uh, those experiencing negative COVID uh, effects. Uh, in particular, they produce resources to support teachers and the transition to online teaching, parents and their children's uh, well-being, uh, the BAME community most hit by COVID, and enable upskilling or reskilling for various groups such as uh, social workers, the deaf and BSL communities. What is remarkable uh, is the fact that uh, many of these projects uh, did not happen in isolation. Uh, they were the result of significant partnerships or collaborations uh, with external to the OU organizations, uh, such as charities and government bodies, um, showcasing the value and direct impact the research can have when it's happening alongside those organizations. Uh, heading forward, these projects could be seen as areas we should uh, focus our attention and put our research efforts on. Uh, in particular, the development of certain skills to cope with post-COVID changes in society, enhance the quality and access to online teaching and learning, promote social justice and reduce inequalities across communities uh, hit by COVID, and uh, support the well-being of parents and uh, children. Uh, this is the end of the first part of this event, and this will be followed by a panel discussion chaired by Professor Denise Whitelock and some exceptional guests. Thank you.